inside India, which where Joshua feels God is leading him to, they have something known as the caste system. The caste system, which was developed in the 1500s, is deeply rooted in Hinduism and their belief in karma and reincarnation. Those in India believe that there are different castes, which originated from, supposedly from Brahma, the Hindu god of creation. There are five different castes inside India's society. There are the Hindu priests and scholars, the rulers and military leaders, the commoner class, the sudras, which are made up mostly of carpenters, and the untouchables. Entire communities are arranged on the basis of the five castes. The upper and, and lower castes are in, live in segregated communities. Even the drinking water, the facilities, are not intermingled. Nearly all of the people in India today identify with the caste regardless of the religious background. Of India's total population of all, almost 100 million people are ranked as untouchables. They're on the lowest rung on the Hindu caste ladder. Untouchables are still not able to draw water out of a drinking well for fear that they might pollute it. Their work is mainly restricted to despised jobs like scavenging, cleaning, and cremating bodies. When we hear and we read about people who are looked down upon by others because they were born into a particular family or into a particular country, our hearts are sad. But if we're not careful, we also can look down upon others as being inferior to us. Prejudice is not something that is new. People have struggled with prejudice over thousands of years. Even back in the days of Joseph in the Old Testament, the Egyptians looked down upon the Hebrews. It says in Genesis 42, 43, verse 32, they served Joseph by himself, the brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to them. Prejudice was way back in the days of, of Joseph in the Old Testament. In Luke 5, verse 30, it says the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees were selected in who they would eat and drink with. They didn't want to defile themselves with Gentiles. In John chapter 4, verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. The Samaritans had intermarried with the Assyrians, and the purebred Jews wouldn't have anything to do with the Samaritans because they had intermarried with the Assyrians. And even the Apostle Peter was very reluctant to initially share the gospel with and to visit with a Gentile named Cornelius because he was prejudiced against the Gentiles. God had to change his heart through a vision. But after God's vision in Acts chapter 10, Peter made this statement in Acts 10, 28. You're well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Even godly people like the Simon Peter, they've been known to look down upon others. But if there's one place inside the entire world where Christians should be accepting of one another, it should be inside the local church. Please notice with me Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Accept one another. Then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. This morning we want to look in this series on the one another's inside the church. We want to look at our need as Christians to accept one another. In spite of all our outward differences and actions, we are to accept one another. There is to be no discrimination whatsoever in God's church. Let's spend some time reflecting upon this verse. The Greek word for accept literally means to take to oneself 
to admit to friendship or hospitality. Thayer's Greek dictionary defines the word accept as to grant one access into one's heart, to take into friendship. Believers are to accept one another, and guess what? That means we're to be friends with each other. We're to love one another. We're to enter into a deep relationship with each other. I want to point out four things relating to the word accept from this verse. Number one, it's in the imper present imperative mood in the Greek language. You say, well, so what's that mean? All that means is that it is a direct command from God himself for Christians to accept one another. If we as Christians do not accept each other, we are breaking a clear command from God himself. Now having said that, we need to realize that while we are to accept each other, that does not mean that we are necessarily to approve of the lifestyle that some Christians live. Some Christians are not living the way God wants them to live. Some Christians, for example, periodically do not control their words. They speak derogatory. They, I've even known Christians to swear many times, actually. Other Christians are living a life of carnality and are not living the way God wants them to live. While we are to accept them as individuals, that doesn't mean that we put a stamp on them and say, hey, I like the way you're living. That's not what it means. Second thing about this word accept is it's in the present tense, meaning it's to be ongoing. It's an ongoing action. We're to continue to accept one another, even when we ruffle each other's feathers. We're to continue to love each other. Third, we have an example of how we are to love each other. If we were to take the time and examine the life of Jesus, we would see that Christ loved and he reached out to people from all different kinds of backgrounds and lifestyles. Jesus spoke to the religious leader named Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He also spoke to a prostitute from Samaria in John chapter 4. The Jews in that day had nothing to do with Samaritans because they had intermarried outside of Judaism. Most of them were part Jewish and part Gentile. That, however, did not prevent Jesus from ministering to this woman. Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. And he also spoke to a tax collector named Matthew in Luke chapter 5. Tax collectors were looked down upon by everyone because they were thieves. We're told them that Matthew was a chief, or Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. And yet what did Jesus do with Zacchaeus? He looked up, Zacchaeus was in the sycamore tree. You remember the little song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree to, for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to your house today. And then you all clap. <laughs> Jesus accepted even this filthy, rich, very wicked man named Zacchaeus. Jesus was the kind of person that held babies. He reached out to widows. He showed compassion to a woman who was, was taken in the actual act of adultery. He ministered to both Jew and Gentile alike. He even reached out to the lepers of his day. Jesus did not have any discrimination whatsoever when it came to accepting people, and neither should we. He didn't dislike any nationality, color, age, or sex. He was totally 100% impartial in his dealings with others. Jesus is an example to us of how we should accept one another inside and outside of the local church. Now this does not mean that we accept their lifestyle. In today's gay world, in today's abortion-centered clinics, it doesn't mean that we have to accept that kind of lifestyle. But we do have to accept the people that are in it because if we're going to reach them for, with the gospel, we've got to love them as Christ loved them. The fourth thing I want to point out is when we accept one another, this brings praise to God. The world is watching the church. The world is watching how do Christians treat each other. We're to accept one another regardless of our nationality, sex, age, or background. And as we do, God is praised. Now, I have to admit that we're all very different from each other. We're all different in our appearance. 
Some people are tall, others are short. Some are stocky, some are thin. We're all different. We all dress differently. Some people dress very casually while others dress up, right? Nice and formal. We're different in our likes and dislikes. Some of us like peas. Others of us hate mashed potatoes. We're all different in our economic status. Some people of God's people are financially well off while others are struggling just to make ends meet. We're all different in our intelligence. Some people have a high IQ and others are struggling just to read and to write. We're all different in our ability. Some of us are good with computers and some of us, like myself, are not. Some of us are talented with plumbing and electricity while others are better at woodworking. We're all different. We're all in different ages. Some of us are older, while others of us are just starting out in life. We're from all different kinds of nationalities. Some are of Irish descent and others from German. We're all different in our values. We don't agree on everything. And we all possess our own set of idiosyncrasies and quirks. There's not a person in this room that does not have some little quirk. Like making sure that the toilet paper has to go down the back. I'm a stickler for this. It has to go down the back. I don't, I don't like the toilet paper going down the front. Other people, if their toothpaste has to be a particular type of brand. Just as there are no two snowflakes that are like. Now you guys, when you come into my home, I know what you're going to do. You're going to turn it around <laughs> just to bug me. I know it's going to happen. I know it. I can see it coming. But by the time you walk back out of the house, it'll be, it'll be turned around the right way. But just as there are no two snowflakes that are like, there are no two Christians that are like, and we are to accept one another. Even identical twins are not truly identical. They have different personalities. But in spite of all of these extreme diversities, God commands us to accept one another. But what is it that prevents us from accepting Christians the way Christ wants us to accept them. Let's look at these three things. The first thing that prevents Christian from accepting other Christians the way we should is our traditions. Sometimes our traditions are just plain legalism when we're trying to force people to live under our own man-made rules and regulations. Easton Bible Dictionary defines a tradition as any kind of teaching, written or spoken, that is handed down from generation to generation. And all of us have our own set of traditions. Many people have the tradition of putting up a Christmas tree every year. Some Christians have the tradition of hiding Easter eggs and allowing their children or grandchildren to find them. Some Christians have the tradition of only eating certain types of food on particular days. Some Christians observe Lent, others don't. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were really hung up on traditions. Please notice me, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had a meticulously tradition where you had to wash your hands just the right way before you could eat a meal. And Jesus' disciples, they didn't wash their hands that way that time. And, then Je and they took Jesus to task over it. Mark 7 verse 3 says the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the traditions of the elders. Some things are not just traditions. Well, with washing our hands, it's also a matter of good hygiene. What our mom and dad always tell us? Wash your hands before you come to eat. Even in restaurants, what do they have? The signs up. Employees must wash their hands before they eat. We have to have signs for everything. Down at the beach, we went down to the beach last week, and sure, they have a list of rules this long that everybody has to observe when they're on the beach. They have to tell people, don't urinate in public. It's right on, the, right on all, the, all the little facts. Why would you have to tell people that? That's where we're at. But the Pharisees and the Jews, they didn't have just 
good hygiene, they had tradition. This was a ceremonial, ritualistic washing that they criticized Jesus' disciples. And this was extremely important to the religious leaders. One rabbi taught, it would be better to walk four miles out of the way to get water rather than eat with unwashed hands. There was even a certain rabbi who was in prison and given a small ration of water who used it to wash his hands instead of drink it, claiming that he would rather die than transgress the traditions. These folks were over the tops. They were the germaphobes. But what was it? It was tradition. They judged people on the basis of their traditions. They had elevated their traditions over the word of God. Mark chapter 7, verse 4, speaks of another tradition of these religious leaders. It says, when they came, when they come to the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. These religious leaders even had traditions about how you washed your cup and how you washed your dishes. Today, we don't have to worry about that. We just put them in the dishwasher. They were afraid that their pots and pans would be polluted by a Gentile or, God forbid, a Samaritan washed their pans. Now, before we're too hard on these religious leaders, we need to ask ourselves the question of whether we have elevated any of our man-made traditions above the Word of God. Some well-meaning Christians have preconceived ideas of what Christians should look like, how we should dress, and what we should or should not do. And more often than not, there's no scriptural support for many of these traditions. We're not to try to place other under others under our man-made traditions. Let me share some of the traditions that some of the more conservatives or traditional churches still have today. In Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, there were churches down there <coughs> where Christians could not smoke, they could not drink, and they could not go to dances. In some of the more traditional churches, men could not have long hair, women could not wear shorts or blue jeans to, to church services, and in some of the very traditional churches, we actually have a church that support us initially, that men and women could not even swim together. You gotta be totally separated. I'm not making this up. Some traditional churches are splitting over whether they will sing the newer choruses that we just sang. There are churches out there that are actually splitting over whether we can sing traditional choruses. Some churches, you can't use any version except the King James. The first thing that prevents Christians from accepting one another is our traditions. Second thing that prevents Christians from accepting other Christians the way we should is our judging of others. Notice with me Romans 14 verses 1 to 3. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. Boy, can I identify with that guy, having been through SIBO. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. These verses deal with the whole area of Christian liberty. One of the reasons Paul wrote to the church at Rome and the church at Corinth was because the stronger believers were passing judgment on the weaker believers, and the weaker believers were passing judgment on the stronger believers. But how can we identify who's a stronger believer versus who is a weaker believer? The weaker believer is a Christian that sets up a lot of rules over issues. He uses a system of rules as a guideline in gray areas. He's very rigid and very inflexible in these rules. The stronger Christian, on the other hand, is a believer that sees the issues and believes nothing's wrong with the gray areas. Therefore, he's not governed by a set of rules. The stronger believer doesn't need a system of rules. He goes by the, by the principle of faith and guidance. When a Christian is totally weak, they're legalistic. When they're totally on the other side, it's totally strong, they're more liberal in their actions. But both the, weak, the weaker and the stronger Christian are to accept one, other, one another inside the body of Christ. 
We're going to be accepting each other up there. We better get used to it down here. There are two central passages that focus on, in depth on Christian liberty. The Romans 14, verses 1 to chapter 15, verse 13, and 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 13. Now, there were two main areas that the early Christians struggled with, with each other. They were over days and diets. The weaker Christian who'd been saved out of Judaism still observed the seven feast days, like Passover and, and Purim and all the others. The weaker Christians that were saved out of paganism, they, weren't, they wouldn't eat meat if it was offered up to an idol. Well, the stronger Christians stopped observing the Jewish feasts when they were saved. And the stronger Christians, they started eating T-bone steak that was offered up to idols. To them, a T-bone steak was good, regardless whether it was offered up to an idol or not. As long as it tasted good, they ate it. But the weaker Christians, they continued observing the, the Jewish feast days, and they could not eat meat that was offered up to an idol. When they did, they felt guilty inside. Their consciences plagued them. Please notice Romans chapter 14, verse 23. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. If a weaker Christian does something that goes against their conscience, they sin against themselves and against God. The central teaching of Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 is that stronger Christians and weaker Christians should not pass judgment on each other, even though they don't agree with each other on some issues, on the gray areas. Let me give an example or two of this from my own personal life. As most, many of you know, I'm from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which at least used to be a very conservative area. I was raised inside a conservative home. My mom and dad never drank alcohol. They never smoked. They never did drugs. We weren't permitted to go to dances and all those kinds of things. But one of the things my dad never allowed any of us to do on a Sunday was to do manual labor on a Sunday. Growing up, I can truly say I never saw my dad one time do manual labor on the Lord's Day. It just never happened. Even if the grass was so long you could bail it, my dad would not cut, would not cut the, his grass on a Sunday. Even if he had a, his, his truck's carburetor, I remember he had that thing tore apart into a million pieces. He had pieces of plywood out in our garage, and he totally tore it apart and then put it back together and it ran. I could tear it apart, I just couldn't get it together so it would run again. But even with it all tore apart, my dad never worked on a Sunday. And I was raised to respect Sundays as a special day. It's, a day. it's God's day. It's a day for the family. And whether I'm a weaker Christian or not, God alone knows. But I literally cannot do manual labor on a Sunday unless it's absolutely necessary. I did remember helping somebody move one time on a Sunday when they were being evicted. But that's pretty much the extent of how far I went. My dad also had a tradition or rule that absolutely nothing was to be placed up top of a Bible. In our home, you could not even put another book up top of a Bible. My dad, he, he did not like that. But while I'm not as strict in this area as what my dad was, I, I still have tried to instill within my children a proper respect for God's word. But we are not to judge one another on the basis of these kind of issues. We're not to judge each other on the basis of whether we mow our yard on a Sunday or not, or whether or not we play cards or observe Christmas or put another book up top of a Bible. Stronger Christians are to accept the weaker Christians, and weaker Christians are to accept the stronger Christians without passing judgment on them because God has accepted them. Why should we not judge uh, the actions of our brothers and sisters in Christ? Notice with me the answer to that question in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 13. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God, so that each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, 
Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. God does not need our help in judging. He's big enough, he's wise enough to handle this job all by himself. He doesn't even need us to judge other Christians. He's got it under control. We should make sure, however, that our lifestyle is not a stumbling block to other Christians. The third thing that prevents Christians from accepting other Christians the way we should is showing partiality or prejudice toward each other. We are not accepting of other people when we are prejudiced or partial against them. Notice James 2, verses 1 to 4. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James condemns Christians showing kindness to people who are rich, nicely dressed, and is showing disdain toward those who are poor and dressed in shabby clothes. Christians should never elevate partiality one person over another. We're not to be partial or prejudiced against anyone. Now, there's a lot of talk today about prejudice. Prejudice has been defined in Webster's Dictionary as a preconceived opinion of others, which is usually unfavorable. One person has defined prejudice or partiality as the favoring of one person over another. Other words that describe it are bigotry, discrimination, and bias. All these words carry with them the unfair men unfair treatment of others on the basis of external circumstances. Some people are partial toward members of their own sex or race. Because of partiality inside the work world and toward white males, our government now has laws called anti-discrimination laws that require larger businesses to employ a certain number or ratio of minorities and female employees. That's how far we've gotten as a nation. Some people are partial toward those who are in a certain financial bracket. They gravitate toward people who are rich, have nice homes. Some people are partial toward those in certain age brackets. They kind of avoid elderly people, people with children. Some people are partial toward those with a similar educational background. They have a college degree, they kind of lock, lock to them and if they but if they only have a high school diploma or GED, they kind of look down on them. Some people are partial toward those that are healthy. They tend to gravitate away from those that are dying of cancer, struggling with debilitating diseases. So others are, poor, are partial toward people of their own religious background. Some of these folks would shy away from people who are Baptists. I hate to tell you this, but there's gonna be all kinds of denominations up in heaven. They're not just gonna be Baptists up there. There's gonna be a lot of people up there. I personally have met people who are prejudiced against blacks. I've met people that are prejudiced against Jews. I've met people that are prejudiced against people that are Spanish or Puerto Rican. And I'd like to say that none of them were Christians. Well, I can't say that. Some of the most prejudiced people I've seen in, in this world are people that claim to be Christians. The third thing that prevents Christians from accepting one another is we should not be showing partiality or prejudice toward others. It should not matter matter whether or not a visitor that comes in our church is, is male or female, black or white, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. We should be impartial in our acceptance. In our, or we should be impartial, yes. Church brochure, Sarah Munoz, put together for us several years ago, read that, reads this on the front. You remember what it reads? You no. are warmly invited. In order for that statement to be true, when a person comes into this church, we should give them, we should, it's almost like a dog. We should say, sick them. Not because we hate them, because we love them in Christ. The church doesn't have chaos. We don't have untouchables. 
We should not judge our brothers and sisters in Christ on the basis of our man-made traditions. Whether we're a strong Christian who doesn't feel guilty doing certain activities and eating and drinking certain things, we should not look down upon our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't, whose consciences don't allow them to do such things. And we should not be guilty of prejudice or partiality. It should not matter at all whether a Christian is male or female, black or white, rich or poor, intelligent or uneducated. We should not be partial toward accepting that. We should love and accept people in the body of Christ regardless of their sex, their race, their nationality, their economic status, or their level of education. Love one another. Accept one another. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Let's close with, with a word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you have accepted us through Christ. That you saw us as we were in our sins. That we were impure before you and yet that did not stop you from working in our lives and bringing us to salvation. We pray, Lord God, that each one of us would accept one another even as Christ has accepted us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together page 423 in the hymn book.